Good morning. Thank you. Morning, everybody. Good morning. Come on in, take your seats. We're just going to make a start. Um, welcome to church this morning, everyone. It's good to be here. Good to see everybody here. Um, are we ready to worship this morning? Yeah. Um, I'm going to start by reading um, a portion of scripture um, and set the tone for our service, um, and then we're going to make a start. So the writer of Hebrews talks of Jesus saying, he is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. Now that's talking about Jesus, our saviour, the one who we've come to worship this morning. And with a, with a headline like that, um, he deserves the worship, doesn't he? Are we ready to worship him, the one who is radiant, the one who sits at the right hand, the one who is so superior, his name is above the angels, the one who has made purification for sins? We know him as our saviour, so we should worship him. Yeah? Yeah. So why don't we take a minute now? Let's sell our hearts. Let's just take a minute. Maybe you want to get in the, get in the, the, the space to worship, worship him as your saviour. Um, and then after a minute, I'm going to pray. And we're going to sing and continue that worship. Um, yeah, let's just take a minute now. Lord, we thank you so much that we can be in this place this morning. We thank you that we can come together and worship you. Father, we thank you for all that you've done for us in sending your son to die for us, to, to make a way for us to know you. Um, and we pray this morning that as we worship you, as we, as we sit in your presence, that your spirit ministers to us, um, yeah, would we be transformed by your power? Um, would you come in power this morning? Would we know that so tangibly this morning? Would you... Um, be with us as we sing, as we hear your word proclaimed, um, and as you dwell amongst us. Father, set our hearts on you. Father, be with us, I pray in this service. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to stand and sing our opening song together, and Mags and the group's going to lead us. Should we stand?
Awesome. Thanks, guys. Um, we've got a long list of announcements to get through and lots of things to share. Um, if you came in and picked up a newsletter, um, have a look at that. There's lots in that. Arnie's going to pick a few things out of that later on when he comes up. Um, but firstly, Paul Davis is going to come up and share something exciting. Ah, he is. He's on his way. Oh, it is exciting. <laughs> he is on his way. Don't worry. Good. I always seem to catch me off guard. Good morning, church. Good morning. Uh, as you know, we had our Easter creative competition uh, over the last few weeks, and uh, thank you to all those who got involved and made something very special for us. I'll give you a few highlights in just a second, but thank you to all of you for getting involved as well. You did very well with your Simon Cowell impression, uh, marking all our uh, voting slips. Uh, here are some of the wonderful creations that we had, and then I'll reveal the winners to us uh, for this morning. We had a lovely set of uh, some amazing cards that retold the whole story of Easter. That was made by one of our families. There's a whole selection out there. We had a lovely Easter mobile made for us, which I thought was very creative. Isn't that good? Retelling the whole story there. Uh, looking at the cross and Jesus rising from the dead as well. We had a, a song written for us. Uh, he paid my debt. He paid my debt for me. So I can be with you. Yeah, I'm not going to sing it. Uh, and I, <laughs> I can be with you, Jesus. The chorus goes, because you died on that cross for me, so I can be with you. Because you protect me every day. You're the Lord, the God who died for me. I thought it was very good, isn't it? Lovely the song. And to finish off, I've got this lovely one. Two, two last things to show you. I've got this lovely one here. The garden, the curtain, and the cross. We looked at this as a... Uh, waterfront kids upstairs look at the whole story of the bible and how it all leads from cover to cover leading from the garden all the way to the cross and it's been lovely made there with the curtain as you can see uh, in the middle and then we have a lovely final one to finish there we have this lovely easter egg he loves us and he is a hero there you are so that's our final one there but i do have two winners uh, for this morning so I'm going to announce the two of them uh, for this morning. If you've entered, don't worry, you will get a prize. Come and see me at the end. But I want to see, can we have a drum roll? Is that okay, church? Can we do a drum roll? Yes. So our winners this year are Jason and Jasmine. Are Jason and Jasmine in the building? They are. Come on down then. Well done. Congratulations. Come and stand by there. Do you want to stand by there for me? That's it. You stand by there then. That's it. And you turn around for me. That's it. Turn around. Oh, congratulations. Well done. Well done. And one for you as well. Well done. And which one is yours? Can you point it out to us? This one. It's this wonderful garden curtain and the cross. Look, isn't that good? And you get a big prize for that. Congratulations. Well done. Stay there. Stay there for me. And our other winner, can I have one more drum roll, please, church? Our other winner, who will be receiving a lovely prize to go home with, is Malachi. Yeah. <laughs> can I come stand there as well? Not that he's excited at all. Congratulations. Well done. Would you like to tell everyone what yours was? Mine was that one. Yours was that one. The Easter egg. Jesus loves us, and he is a hero. Congratulations. Well done. She. Do you want to take a bow? Yeah. Take a bow, and let's give one more round of applause, shall we? Well done, well done, sweet dad. Then you come down. Congratulations. Well done, sweet dad. come down. Thank you very much. Bless you. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Well done, guys. Excellent work. <laughs> That's all I've got. <laughs> um, swiftly moving on through the generations, um, we have um, Sharon, who's going to come and share with us now. Sharon is one of our young adults, our old friend, and she um, has felt like she wanted to share um, somewhat of a testimony with you now. Um, so Sharon, come on up. Good morning, everyone. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Sharon, and I'm here to share my testimony of God, what he, what he has done over the past four years of my life. 
before I go into my testimony, I want to give a brief introduction of who I am. So <laughs> I initially grew up in London all my life and I came to Swansea University to do my undergraduate. And Swansea is one of the few universities that does an undergraduate and has a specific course for graduate entry medicine. And my initial goal was to do medicine and I was the pandemic student and choosing which uni to go to was the biggest decision of my life. And there were so many universities, so many different courses. And my mother is the one who looked up this whole course and was telling me about it. And I absolutely fell in love. I was like, okay, it will give me a chance to progress, you know, to do an undergraduate as well as progress into medicine later. So um, to get into medicine, there's certain criteria you need to meet. And it is a very long list of criteria, but I'll tell you quite briefly. So you need to do GAMSAT, which is a six hour exam. And it takes a minimum of three months to revise for. So I spent my summers of year one and year two prepping for that, as well as doing work experience. So any opportunity I got, I was doing work experience in Morriston Hospital, Singleton Hospital. Even when I went to India, um, I did a lot of work experience there. And um, you need to get like certain grades as well in your A-levels, GCSEs, in your university grades as well. So I was trying to hit all those criteria. It was an endless journey for me. And um, at that time, towards the start of year three, my brother needed to go to sixth form. And my parents were in India at the moment and we couldn't come in back in time. My mother applied in Swansea as well, in Gawa College. And he actually got the course that he wanted in Gawa College. And we were like, okay, it's God's plan for us to come here. And they came down and I was here as well. So I was like, okay, maybe it is God's plan for us to stay in Swansea. And um, in f around February, I got into, I got a interview from Swansea and I was like, this is great. <laughs> All that I dreamt for is finally happening. So I got the interview. I was like, okay, now I just need to prep for the interview. So I did my breast. I was doing my dissertation, my exams and everything, as well as prepping for the interview. Gave my 100%. I was like, okay, now I just wait for it. And around February, I found out last year that I was in the waiting list. So I was like, oh God, what is happening? Um, I'm in the waiting list. But then I was like, you know what? I'm just going to graduate and focus on my degree and carry on with that. And I just focused on my degree and I graduated around July. And the one question everyone asks you as soon as you graduate is, so what's next? And I had no answer for it. And a person like me who likes to plan everything ahead, who likes to know what's happening, I had no definite answer. And there's a lot of people in church who used to be like, oh, what are you doing next? And I'd be like, well, I'm on the waiting list. I'm waiting and see what happened. And I remember I was here as well, and I was saying, I'm on the waiting list. And I felt like the more people I was telling, the more expectations I was building up. And I was, at the back of my head, I was like, what if I don't get in? Then I have to tell everyone I didn't get in. And it was quite nerve wracking. And then it was like, for six months, I was on the waiting list. And those six months were the worst months of my life. Because I didn't know what was happening. I couldn't even plan anything. Because what if I did get in? And maybe, you know, if I planned something, that would be not according to what I wanted. So uh, I got offers as physician associate back in London. I got offers as neuroscience in Marston's in Swansea. But then I rejected this because I was like, how long am I gonna carry on doing something I really don't enjoy because medicine is something that I really wanted to do. And I just had faith in God, you know, my dad was praying every day, you know, continuously praying and saying, they were very encouraging this whole time. And I was hoping for it. And then around August, I find out that I didn't get in. <laughs> It was, it was very heartbreaking for me. It was a very heartbreaking moment and it was very devastating. And it was kind of a false hope, you know, I dragged it out for six months and then I was, it got to the point that I was avoiding conversations with people because I was scared the whole topic of medicine would come in and then I had to say, no, I didn't get in and I failed. And I, you know, the whole acceptance of failure is not easy for everyone. And um, I was trying to stay strong in faith and around, um, the start of the year. So in India, we take promises that would guide us throughout the year. And the promise I got this year was Deuteronomy 20, verse 3 to 4. And it says, Hear, O Israel, today you're drawing near for the battle against your enemies. Do not be weak-hearted or afraid, alarmed or frightened by them. For it is the Lord your God who goes with you to fight against your enemies and give you victory. And I thought this was such a encouraging Bible was because essentially I am going against, against a battle <laughs> within myself and it was just really um, 
it was just too much for me to fathom and you know I decided to take a gap year as something I didn't wasn't really looking forward to something I didn't thought I would be in the position of and I rejected all my other offers and I decided to take a gap year and I started working with autistic kids though my god that was the hardest job I ever done it was um so it, there were so many things that I faced in the job, you know, I'd, I had so many behaviors and like it's a 12 and a half hour job every day I would go in and so, so many times I wanted to quit, but then I thought to myself, I didn't want to quit because I couldn't do it. I wanted to quit because I got into medicine and I just wanted to have faith in God. And um, this is Bible verse I have as my wallpaper and it says, the Lord is with me. I will not be afraid. What can more mortals do to me? The Lord is with me. He is my helper. I look in the triumph of my enemies. And I, I just read that verse every time. And also, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. And I think these are just encouraging Bible verses for me. And I think this is what helped me got through the year. So I reapplied again this year with, the, with no negative thinking or anything. And I just, me and my parents, we just prayed uh, continuously and we were like, we're gonna have full positive thinking, and we're gonna, you know, give our um, give our 110 percent. Last time was 100 percent. I'm gonna give 110 uh, percent, and this time I applied to all the unis because last year I was just so focused on Swansea. I was like, this is all I need. I don't need to worry about the other universities. But this time I applied to different universities, and I was like, I'm gonna put um, try my best with it. So I applied to St Andrews, Ulster, and Swansea. And by God's grace, on the 1st of April, I got my first offer in St. Andrews. And then later I heard from Ulster, and then I got into Swansea on the 12th of April. <laughs> yeah. it, it was a life-changing moment for me. And I, was, I remember, you know, I got the opportunity to do a lot of things that I couldn't do when I was doing my degree. I went a weekend away, I did a lot of traveling, Europe traveling. And I think it was God's plan for me to take a break, you know, actually work on myself. You know, my work has taught me a lot of patience and a lot of resilience and persistence. And I think it taught me to just trust in God's plans. And I know it's really hard for whoever who is facing troubles. I know it's hard, but just trust in God and he is there for you. And he taught me that it's his timing and not my timing. And there is no battle you can you can't pass without God's help. So thank God for it. Amen. You ready to do some worship this morning? Should we stand?
um, we prayed earlier in the service that God would speak to us today and he would come in power. And our brother Paul wants to share a word with us this morning. You've been seeking me regarding those who are sick. But I want to speak to you this morning. And I want to speak to you especially and directly. And I want to say to you, when are you going to take hold of me? And get serious and get real with me this morning. I speak to you younger men to put away those other things. Things that just occupy your mind and your activities. When are you going to get a hold of me? I speak to you, some of you older men. You've been in my, in my field for such a long time. But when are you going to put your hand finally on that plow and follow me? The time is short and your time is short. And I'm speaking directly to you now that you... You would just put away other things and lay hold of me. Because I'm looking at you directly now. I know the things in your life. I know what's before you. But I am saying to you, take hold of me now. It's time to put your hand on the plow and follow me, says the Lord. As you listen to my voice, as you've heard me speaking already, I want to reinforce that word this morning from myself to you, to you as individuals, to you as a fellowship. The time is now. The time is now for you to move out, not next week. Not tomorrow, but now. Now is the time that I would have you to put your hand to that plow. Male or female, boy or girl, I want you to move out and I want to step out in faith believing. I will not let you down. I will not forsake you. I will prove to you who I am. I am your father. I am your God. I am your creator, but I'm also your savior, your friend, your brother that sticks close. And therefore, this morning, as you begin to follow me, as your mind is tuned into me right now, I want you to just spend that moment with me that I may show you and direct you in the way that you ought to go, that I might direct you to which plow, to which field, that you might know that I am the Lord your God, and I love you, say it.
is bringing this word to you this morning. Isaiah 43 verses 1 to 2. Listen to the Lord who created you. The one who formed you says, do not be afraid for I have ransomed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you go through deep waters, 
I will be with you. When you go through rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. When you walk through the fire of oppression, you will not be burned up. The flames will not consume you. For I am the Lord, your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Saviour. Amen. And thank you, Alison, for I am the Lord, your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Saviour. Thank God we have a Saviour this morning. Let's pray together. Father God, this is your word. And will you honour your word? Well, we know you will honour your word. And I just pray that you will use your word to challenge our hearts and even encourage us this morning for Jesus' sake. Amen. Am I a true disciple? Am I a true disciple? That's a challenging question, not just for myself, but for us all to ask this morning. You've heard me say time and time again that to be a Christian is all of grace and nothing of me. My salvation is on the basis of Christ's atoning sacrifice on the cross on my behalf. There is nothing that I can add to it. He has done it all. Therefore, heaven is mine this morning on the basis of my faith, which again is a gift from God, faith in what He has done for me on Calvary. However, moving from being a simple believer to becoming a disciple is both costly and challenging. The Greek word for disciple in the New Testament is the word mathetes, which basically means a student or a learner. A disciple is also a follower, someone who adheres completely to the teachings of another, making them the rule for his or her life and conduct. In the time of Jesus, disciples were spoken of as both apprentice to a tradesman and even also imitators of their masters. And the Apostle Paul writes to the church in Ephesus, and he begins the fifth chapter of uh, that uh, particular book with these words, Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. Let's be honest. For me, with my fallen human nature, to imitate God is not something that's going to be easy. However, true discipleship challenges me this morning to be that person, despite my failings and shortcomings, to strive to live a life which reflects something of the life of Jesus. Remember years ago we used to sing uh, a song and, and one line of the lyrics says, Life of Jesus shining through, bringing glory back to you. I do this by striving daily to adhere completely to the teachings of Christ, making them the rule for my life and conduct. I may not always win, I may fall, I may stumble on the way, but I aim to imitate Jesus if I'm a true disciple. Let's continue in our study in the book of the Gospel of Mark, and this morning we're in chapter 8, and let me read to you verses 34 through to 38. Mark records these words for us. Then, 
he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life must lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What goes is it for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when He comes in His Father's glory with the holy angels. Francis Chan said these words, The world says, Love yourself, grab all you can, follow your heart. Jesus says, Deny yourself, grab your cross, and follow me. Let me highlight three things that Jesus has to say about discipleship from these verses. The first is this. Discipleship involves self-denial. Discipleship involves self-denial. Jesus taught that to be His disciple, His follower, the spiritual discipline of self-denial is required. Look at verse 34. Then he called the crowd along with his disciples and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves. Denying yourself is an essential part of the Christian life. Jesus called upon those who wish to be his followers to reject the natural human inclination towards selfishness. You see, by nature, we're all selfish. We do what we want to do. But the Lord himself exemplified self-denial. In John chapter 13, for example, and the first 17 verses of John 13, we have that instance when Jesus washes his disciples' feet. This was a ministry that would have been reserved for the servant. The master would never be engaged in such a menial, degrading task as to wash wash the dusty feet of guests. However, the Lord of glory... The master of the universe, he who is holy, separated from sinners, exalted above the heavens, takes a towel and washes the dusty feet of sinners. He denied himself in order to serve others. Furthermore, his very coming to earth, in one respect, was an amazing act of self-denial. Listen to how the Apostle Paul puts it when writing to the believers at Philippi. He said, you, that's us, must have the same attitude as Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think equality with God something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. And when he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. What an example Jesus has given us this morning when it comes to self Denial. When Jesus said, if anybody wants to follow me, he must deny himself, he is not asking us to do something which he himself was not prepared to do. You see, many a leader 
would ask us to do things that they themselves are not prepared to do, but not Jesus. He humbled himself, came into our world, humbled himself again by being obedient to death, even death on the cross, the author of life, dying for you and for me. Can I suggest this morning that self-denial for Christian discipleship is twofold. First of all, self-denial for the Christian means renouncing oneself as the center of existence. And this, of course, goes against the natural instinct of the human will. And we must recognize that Jesus is now our new center. It means acknowledging that the old self is dead, and the new life, my new life, is now hidden with God in Christ. You see, by nature, let's be honest, we're all egotistic. Or am I the only one? Let's be honest, our motto is me first, me second, and if anything's left over, that's mine as well. That's our prone. However, the whole universe does not revolve around us when we become Christian. Christian self-denial places Jesus at the center of everything. And everything means everything. Jesus is not on the circumference of our lives if we are disciples. He's at the very center of everything. Christian self-denial does not mean me trying to fit Jesus into my life and my ambitions, but rather Jesus takes center stage in everything I do. I seek to ensure that my ambitions line up with His plans for my life. Secondly, Christian self-denial involves me also putting others first before my own self-interest. Listen to Paul again. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Don't look, only, look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. Denying yourself means seeking the good of others before looking out for number one. Listen to what Paul says when he writes to the believers in Corinth, 1 Corinthians 10, 24. Don't be concerned for your own good, but for the good of others. You see, self-denial cuts right across selfish human nature. However, this is the cost of true discipleship. Am I this morning a true disciple? Listen, who says that Christianity is for wimps? Jesus, this is tough stuff you're asking me to do this morning. And God whispers back, Arnold, my grace is sufficient for you. So, discipleship is costly because first of all, it involves self-denial. Secondly, discipleship is costly because it involves sacrifice. Jesus 
taught that to be his disciple, his follower, the spiritual discipline of sacrifice is required. Look again at verse 34. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and says, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up the cross and follow me. And the cross speaks of sacrifice. It was via the cross that Jesus made the atoning sacrifice for your sin and for mine. I'm a Christian this morning, not because of anything I have done, but rather all because of what Jesus has done and His ultimate sacrifice for you and for me on the cross of Calvary. Pastor George Perfect wrote a hymn when he thought of the great sacrifice of Jesus. He said, pardoned is all my sin this morning at Calvary. Cleansed is my heart within at Calvary. Now robes of praise I wear. Gone are my griefs and care. Christ bore my burden there at Calvary. The ultimate sacrifice was made by Christ at Calvary, and in His sacrifice, I have all I need for salvation. Another hymn writer says, it is enough that Jesus died and that He died for me. Well, becoming a Christian costs me nothing Because it's all of grace, and it's free, as Paul tells the Romans, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. However, while salvation is free, discipleship is costly. In coming to Christ, there is a lifestyle to employ. And this lifestyle means obedience to the teachings of Christ. And the teachings very often are at odds with the values of this world. And Jesus told his disciples in John 15, 20, if they persecute me, they will also persecute you. No one who follows Christ will escape the hostility of this world, at least to some degree. And even, not all of us, thank God, will have to face the martyrdom that some of the disciples face and that some persecuted Christians in the world today are facing. Nevertheless, Christianity as discipleship, rather, is costly. Paul says, the world has been crucified to me, and I to the Word. And in the prophetic utterance this morning, there was a challenge to us. Hey, have I crucified the Word? And the challenge was not just, if you remember, to young people, but to old people as well. Have I crucified the Word? Have I put aside the things of the world in order to be a true disciple and take up my cross and follow Jesus? And the challenge is that it's today, not tomorrow, not next week. This morning, time for you and me to take up our cross or to put our shoulder to the plow and be a true disciple of Jesus Christ. During World War II, there was a a German Protestant pastor, an intellectual, who wrote a, a book called The Cost of Discipleship. His name was Dietrich Bonhoeffer. I may not agree with all his theological views. However, in him we find a man who was willing to pay the true price of discipleship. He stood up against Hitler and the Third Reich evil policies, and as a result, he was both imprisoned and executed by the Nazis. Bonhoeffer warned the church about what he called 
the spirit of cheap grace, of discipleship without cost, of a Christian life without danger. And I believe wholeheartedly this morning in this gospel of grace. However, with it comes the danger that we adopt what Bonhoeffer calls the spirit of cheap grace. Of this cross that Jesus calls us as disciples to take up, John MacArthur said this, a cross is not having an unsaved husband, a nagging wife. And I was on a, a, a journey in the car with Pastor Paul Ashman. We went to a conference. And sorry, Paul, what you mentioned about a nagging wife is not, <laughs> according to MacArthur, taking up your cross. So he says a cross is not having an unsaved husband, a nagging wife, or a domineering mother-in-law. And there may be some of those here, I don't know. Nor is it having a physical handicap or suffering from an incurable disease. To take up one's cross, says MacArthur, is simply to be willing to pay any price, price for Christ's sake. He goes on to say, it's the willingness to endure shame, embarrassment, reproach, rejection, persecution, and even martyrdom for His sake. Wow. This is discipleship. The cross represents suffering that is ours because of our relationship with Jesus. Christ does not call disciples to Himself in order to make their lives easy and prosperous, but rather to make them holy and productive. Willingness to take up His cross is the mark of a true disciple. And one hymnist said, Must Jesus bear the cross alone and all the world go free? No, there's a cross for everyone and there's a cross for me. Those who make initial confessions of their desires to follow Jesus Christ must refuse but, sorry, but refuse to accept hardship or persecution, then they have not really counted the cost of what it means to be a disciple. You see, many people want a no-cost discipleship, but Christ offers no such option. I'm sorry this morning, there's no other discipleship option available. There's only one program. You know, you can't choose, you know, well, I'll, I'll choose Alpha or I'll choose Christianity. There's just one option. Deny yourself, take up the cross, and follow Jesus. Who on earth in his right mind said, that Christianity is for wimps. Jesus, this is tough. You're asking me to take up the cross. But Jesus says, Arnold, my grace is sufficient for thee. And then thirdly, quickly, because our clock is moving, discipleship involves shamelessness. What is shamelessness? Well, if you were to look it up in the dictionary, it would say this, a lack of shame, especially about something generally considered unacceptable. Lack of shame about something that is generally considered unacceptable. The Greek word translated 
ashamed refers to being embarrassed or fearful of ridicule. That's what ashamed means. Let's be honest. It can be a bit fearful to say that you're a Christian, especially for teenagers in school. There is that fear of being ridiculed, of being rejected by your peers, and sometimes confessing your faith can be a joy killer and a conversation killer. Have you found that? You know, very often in, in my line of work, you know, you're in a group or something, and, and, and people ask you, uh, what's your work? And the moment I say I'm a church minister, oh, it's a nice day, isn't it? <laughs> you know, and it's the same. Saying you're a Christian, and you're following Jesus, you're a disciple of Christ, can be a conversation killer. But my aim this morning is not to make anybody guilt, feel guilty, but to encourage you to be the disciple that Jesus calls you to be. Ones that are willing, yes, to endure ridicule for the sake of the gospel. Believing the Bible and living by the teaching of Jesus was never popular in history. And neither is it popular today in liberal society. However, discipleship involves shamelessness, despite the fact that many of the words of Jesus are unacceptable to many in today's society. Let me share with you as I bring my message to a close, five simple but important reasons why discipleship, why disciples rather, should not be ashamed of the words of Jesus. First of all, I should not be ashamed of Jesus because he is not ashamed of me. Jesus, my friend, this morning is not ashamed of you. That's what my Bible tells me. Listen to Hebrews 2 and 11. For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. This is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers. My friends, this morning, Jesus is not ashamed of referring to you as one of his siblings. So why then should I be ashamed of him? This is me, remember, a sinner who daily battles with sinful desires. This is me, remember, who falls and falters in my Christian walk. This is me, remember, who does the things I don't want to do and don't do the things that I do want to do. And yet, this Jesus, who is pure, holy, separated from sinners, exalted above the heavens, is not ashamed to call me his brother. Why should I this morning be ashamed of him? Secondly, I should not be ashamed of Jesus because he alone can and has saved me. Listen, Jesus is my only Savior. I cannot save myself and there's nobody else in heaven, earth or hell who can save me. Peter said, listen guys, he told the religious leaders, salvation is found in no one else. There is no other name and a heaven among men whereby we must be saved. Without Jesus, let's call a spade a spade, without Jesus I'm bound for hell. And you with me as well. But Jesus is my saviour. Why on earth should I therefore be ashamed of him? Thirdly, I shouldn't be ashamed of Jesus because his words are true. 
Why should I be ashamed of Jesus when, he, when we know that everything he has spoken is true? In a world of lies and deceit, and promises made, and as soon as they're made, they are broken. Jesus is trustworthy, true, and reliable. He said, heaven and earth will pass away, but not one jot or tittle of my words will pass away. Therefore, what he says about my future is true. He has gone to prepare a place for me, and I am going to spend eternity with him. So guys, why should I be ashamed of him? Fourthly, I should not be ashamed of Jesus because his way is the best way. The Bible teaches us that there is a way that seems right to man, but in the end it leads to death. However, Psalm 25 and 10 says that all the ways of the Lord are loving and faithful towards those who keep the commands, the demands of his covenant. And David, when he ponders on God's best way, he says, he leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness. He always has my best interest at heart, and He leads me in the best paths, and He has prepared a better way of living for me. So guys, why should I be ashamed of Him? And finally, I should not be ashamed of Jesus because when I stand up for him, he stands up for me. Listen to Romans 8, 34. Who then shall condemn us? No one. For Christ Jesus died for us and was raised to life for us and is sitting in the place of honor at God's right hand pleading for us. I have someone in Jesus who stands up for me, pleads my cause before my Father in heaven. Listen to the words of the Apostle Paul, Apostle John, sorry, 1 John 2 and verse 1. My dear children, I'm writing this to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, and I don't know about you, I do, if anyone does sin, we have an advocate who pleads our cause before the Father. He is Jesus Christ, the one who is truly righteous. And this morning, I say, thank God for Jesus. So why should I be ashamed of him? In closing this morning, resolve now. God helping you to live for Christ and nothing but Christ, no matter what the cost. Do not blush to speak his name or to stand by every word he has spoken. For what does it profit the man at the end of the day if he gains the whole world, celebrity, admiration, the dream spouse, a thrilling career, safety from persecution, if having all of them, Christ is ashamed of him and he loses his own soul. I end with the words of Greg Morse who said, live like you know Christ, like you love Christ, like you are waiting unashamedly for Christ to return. This is true discipleship. Denying yourself, taking up the cross, and being unashamed of our glorious Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 
Um, thank you, Pastor, for your message. And may that challenge us as we leave this place, as we cling closely to Jesus, um, as we go about our weeks and we seek to be those disciples um, who we've, we've seen as examples in, uh, in your message. Thank you for that. Um, we're going to sing. We're going to end the service with a song. Mark, the group will lead us. Um, we're going to also take up collection during this time. So dig deep because uh, there's some charges coming with that recycling, isn't it? So uh, maybe you need to fill the collection put up a bit more. And if you're a visitor, please let the basket pass by. Um, but let's sing and take up our offering and then we'll pray to close. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you for um, this morning. We thank you that we can um, come and meet and that we've been able to hear from you. Thank you you've been with us. Thank you that you have heard our prayers. You've heard our worship. You know our hearts, Lord. And Father, we pray that we would be resting in your presence this week um, as we cling so closely to you, as we, as we walk our weeks um, as disciples of you, as costly as that may be. Father, would you help us as we continue to think about what we've heard, as we, as we think about those who are sick, as we, um, as we continue in all that we get up to this week? Would you be with us? Um, Father, would you, by your spirit, continue to shape us and mold us into a greater likeness of your son, Jesus? We pray these things in your son's precious name. Amen. <laughs>